Hi, my name is Tamo Nakahara. Uh, I'm from a company called Weaveworks, and hopefully you're here because this is the Weave Online User Group. If this is your first time, welcome. Uh, today, we are very lucky to have uh, Chris Love from LionCube. He'll be talking about streamlining Kubernetes applications with CICD with Bazel. So um, this is a weekly series that we usually do on Tuesdays now this year. And uh, um, if you have uh, interest in other topics, well, we'll be sharing more links at the end. So welcome, thanks for coming. Uh, before we get started, I'm going to do a quick little promo for um, our background. So like I said, I work for a company called Weaveworks. Um, we have a third person here who's Stacy, who's our community manager on the developer experience team. Uh, my name is Tamo Nakahar. I run the developer experience team at Weaveworks. We're a startup based in London, San Francisco, New York, Berlin, Colorado, um, and a few more offices I think I might be missing. Uh, we've been in this space now, um, actually running Kubernetes in production for four years. And I'll share that uh, RabbitMQ is part of our background. Hopefully you've heard of that technology. Our CEO and CTO are the creators of the technology and the company that they then sold to Weaveworks, I'm uh, sorry, to, sorry, to VMware. Uh, and then they started seeing needs in the container and um, Kubernetes spaces and built certain technologies and products that then um, became folded into a company called Weaveworks. Uh, we are VC funded by Excel Partners and a few others, um, but I'll mention that we are, one of our um, uh, backers is Google Ventures, so that will kind of come to play as part of our general involvement in the Kubernetes community. Uh, some of our background is in open source. Some of you may know WeaveNet, which was, um, I believe, the first project, and it helps people even today uh, as the premier solution for networking your Kubernetes clusters. Um, some others you may have heard of is Cortex, which um, helps um, make Prometheus horizontally scalable, um, as well as uh, expendable in different ways. Um, that is part of the CNCF now. Uh, we have another project called Flux, which is uh, part of our GitOps, if you've heard that term, or um, does helps with automated deployments. That has just joined C the CNCF as a sandbox project. Uh, we have Weave Scope that helps with observability. Um, and we have many more, um, but one of our latest ones is Weave Flagger, which um, provides progressive deliveries such as canary deployments, blue green, A B testing um, to your um, clusters using service mesh technologies, or actually, it's possible to do it without. We also have products. Uh, our main product that we've had is a SaaS product called Weave Cloud, and it helps you manage your Kubernetes clusters, do monitoring using Prometheus, and do automated deployments. So, in a way, it's some of the technologies that I mentioned um, hosted and um, kind of bound together in a way that's much more meaningful than what you would do if you're using open source. Um, and it's as a service, so of course it takes away a lot of the work, the setup and the maintenance work. Uh, we've been running Weave Cloud on Kubernetes on AWS um, for four years now. And so we are actually in the process of productizing the Kubernetes platform that we built to do that. And that will be called Weave Kubernetes Platform or WKP. Um, and as I mentioned, we coined the term GitOps and this operations by pull request. And um, so the product that we're building is very aware of that way of um, doing GitOps. Of course, since we've been running um, Kubernetes in production all these years, sometimes people need some assistance while using these products to get started or moving forward in their Kubernetes or the GitOps journey. So we're happy to provide some consulting or training and support for that. So if you have any questions, feel free to contact me. Um, if you haven't come to our website before, it's weave.works. So thanks for listening. So as I mentioned today, we're very lucky to have uh, Chris Love as our speaker. He's the founder of LionCube. And uh, we'll be talking for approximately 30 to 45 minutes. These sessions can be as short as 30. Um, they usually range about 45. Um, but um, Chris will speak and we'll do Q&A. Uh, I'll check in with Chris to see if he likes questions throughout or at the end. We'll figure that out. Um, when you do ask questions, we're using a platform called Zoom. And uh, the best way is to ask through the chat box. Hopefully you've found a button for chat so far. Um, if not, sometimes hitting escape gets you out of full screen mode and helps you see the Zoom um, menu a little bit easier to find that chat box. 
Uh, again, when you chat, please make sure that you chat to everyone or to all panelists and attendees. Otherwise, um, people can't see your questions. Um, it'll only be us. So um, please remember to do that. So with that, I will hand it over to Chris. Let me know if you can just take over the sharing or if I have to stop sharing. Absolutely. Stop sharing, yes. You need me to stop sharing? No, it's, I'm reading the boxes here. Great. So we, are, we are good. Great. And do you like questions throughout or do you like them towards, at the end? Yeah, absolutely. But somebody probably needs to interrupt me. Um, to yes, look. I will be the one to say, there's a question in the chat box. Exactly. And can everybody, or can you see my screen now? Yes, we can. Excellent. So happy Tuesday, everybody. Um, my name is Chris Love, as she said. Uh, and with a company called LionCube, we do consulting in the Kubernetes space as well as Bazel, as well as training and container migration and all that good stuff. So today I wanted to chat with you a bit about Bazel and Kubernetes. So Bazel was created within Google as a product called Blaze, and then they open sourced it and it's now named Bazel. And the reason they created Blaze is because they've got a big repository, they've got big code. So if you look at lines of code in, you know, in uh, uh, the Linux kernel, and then compare it against lines of code in Kubernetes, and then from there, you know, let's talk about Windows, right? But Google, well, they kind of go off the screen. So there we go. So Google currently has that number of lines of code. And I'm not joking. Oops. Let me see if I can go back here. Uh, presentation issues. Got to love it. Wrong way. There we go. So I'm trying to move a window over to actually read 200, tr 200 trillion lines of code that they build every day, multiple times every day. So with big code, you have big builds, big tests, really big tests. And what I mean by that is it takes a long time to run all the unit tests and integration tests with a code repository that's that large. Well, of course, the majority of the companies that don't have that many lines of code. So why would we even consider Bazel in? The main thing is, so there's three main topics I want to talk about. First is deterministic. So with builds, it, it, it is a non-random, or with Bazel, it's a non-random, uh, or allows for non-random builds. And what I mean by that is that you will, your build should be the exact same every time. We've, you know, you got to admit it, we've all had builds that go into production and we have to roll back. And for some reason, we can't redo the build. Well, with determinism, you're guaranteed that you have the same type of build every time as well as you're guaranteed that you can read or you, you most likely or have a better chance of redoing your builds. As well as this hermetic. So you have, your builds are completely encapsulated. We're gonna go through an example of Go today. And within the, the example, Bazel will actually go and download Go. So you're guaranteed with your developers, for instance, that the same version of Python is used. And I know you've never had any problems with uh, different versioning within Python modules or Python itself, or with Go, or with any language where you get different versions of say a dependency pulled in, or say the actual programming language pulled in. What you're able to do is specifically encapsulate the deterministic build inside of a glass jar, which creates hermetic. As well as it runs dry tests. And what that means is that you are able to only run the unit tests on the code that's been touched, which is huge. Let's say you have a monolithic repository, you have a lot of unit tests in a microservice. You do not have to run the tests again or the full battery of tests every time. Within most modern build tools, you do have to run the full battery of tests every time. Within Bazel, it has a dependency tree and it is able to tell which of the unit tests need to be run. Also, you can execute builds and tests in parallel, which is huge. 
within a lot of build tools nowadays, everything's going linear. Within Bazel, it actually fans out. Also, it has capability of remote builds, which is a huge thing. We're not gonna go into remote builds too much, but if you think about it, you say you have a, a bunch of repositories or a large repository, code repository. Your developers are gonna have to, or developers are gonna have to compile all that code. And what occurs is, is only when you spike a new project do you lose your cache. So, or you have to pull down a new cache. And with remote builds, not only is that, but it's also doing the builds on remote machines, which is really powerful. Is for instance, today I'm just using my MacBook Air. But if I have, say, a Node.js build, which has 6,000 targets, which is not unusual for a small Node.js project, it's going to take a long time to pull down all those targets, all those dependencies, and build those dependencies as well. And it builds those dependencies from scratch within Bazel. Also, build, Bazel is built to build all things. And what I mean by that is it builds C, it builds C++. It builds a huge number of languages now and it's built to extend so we can uh, create a new rule for a new language. And the rules that we're gonna go over today are for container or for Go, for container building, and as well as for Kubernetes. I've started up a Kubernetes cluster already. Now I'm gonna drop the command line. What I'm actually gonna do right now is spike a new project. So I'm gonna create a project in Go or with Go, show you how to integrate with Bazel, then show you how to build a container from it, and then from there, I'm actually gonna build uh, or deploy it on a, onto a Kubernetes cluster. Let's see exactly how well uh, we're doing today in terms of running a live coding demo. So we're just gonna jump right into it. We have any questions out there yet? Not right now. All right, excellent. So I'm gonna shut down the presentation window. As I mentioned, I have a Kubernetes cluster up and running. And I have a how-to doc that I've written. All this is gonna be in a, a public repository that I'm gonna push, or that is already up. I need to clean it up a bit. So let's create a new folder here. Let's go inside the folder. All right. And we're just gonna to touch some new files. We're gonna to touch Workspace, we're going to touch Bazel build.bazel, and we're going to touch main.go. So there's two files initially that you start off with any project. One's the workspace file, which defines the versions of rules that you're pulling into your repository, and the other is the build.bazel. Now you'll have multiple, typically you'll have multiple build.bazel files in each of the directories that you lay out. We're just doing a simple project today with just a single directory. So we don't have multiple directories across. So let's copy over actually the main.go because I'm not gonna waste, I'm not gonna show you guys how to code uh, a Go file, but it's pretty simple. You know, we're doing, uh, we've got a, a car struct, we've got a brand, we're using Gorilla in terms of doing REST services. We've got different endpoints. So it's a basic REST service within Go. All right. So I'm gonna wander over to a component called Gazelle. And as I mentioned, you have build rules. And within the Go community, we have a build rule that runs Gazelle. Gazelle is a tool to manage dependencies within Bazel for Go specifically. And also it's going to pull, pull in the Go rules as well. So if I scroll down, here we go. It's got a load statement. Now if we notice here, it's got a load statement which defines HTTP archive. HTTP archive pulls down to my machine the actual release of rules.go as well as Gazelle as well as it does a registering of a tool chain. So it uses a bunch of language, it uses a, a language called Skylark, which is a Python type language, which actually runs inside of Bazel. So if we copy all this into our workspace file, we'll copy and paste going on here. 
we now have defined all of our rules within our workspace file for Gazelle. And then we're gonna to have to wander over to our build.bazel file. And we're gonna to have to define a few things. We're gonna to have to load again the definition of Gazelle right here. And then we're gonna to have to do a prefix which is specific to Gazelle, which is basically allowing us, which, which tells Gazelle where our Go path is and what our Go project name is. So if I do that teaching, or actually I wanna do, Get in the directory that we're in. Let's copy that. Let's see if my copy and paste works. Hey, there we go. So what we set up is we've got in my GoPath, I've got GitHub.com, Crystal of CNM, Basil Live Demo, and we're, it's loading Gazelle named as Gazelle. So we're now able to to use Basil at the command line to spike this project a bit. What we're going to do first is we're actually going to use uh, Go modules. And we're going to do uh, a knit on this project so that we get the modules properly set up. And we're going to I'm copy and pasting. I've got some basic command lines here, so I don't forget them because I always do. So that creates the go.mod. In, in essence, uh, it's creating the same type of dependency management as Maven or other Python management tool, dependency management tools. And then we're going to run the tidy and what the tidy is going to do is it's going to pull, it's going to look at my main.go code and it's going to pull in all of the dependencies. So now we've got a go.mod. So we've got requiring on two different dependencies. I'm using Gorilla and I'm also using uh, K log from the Kubernetes project, which is replacing G log. And then there's a go.sum as well, and that's pulling in the hashes. So typically with Go, I would just I would stop there, right? I've got the dependency management set up great. I would have to pull down the vendor uh, dependencies, you know, maybe have a vendoring directory or allow uh, Go to pull them down dynamically. Well, we don't want to do that. What we want to be able to do is have developers have the project have hermetic project where I'm always guaranteeing that this hash is being pulled down and I want everything to be managed by, by Bazel. And what we do here is we run the gazelle command. There's different targets that you can do with, with Bazel. For instance, and it's going to start up the server and I've got another server running, so it's going to take a second here. So in each folder it has, or in each project, it runs a Bazel server. So, it's, so I had it running in a different folder. Now it's going to switch over. So take a couple seconds. As I was mentioning, the primary uh, targets you run are Bazel uh, build, Bazel test, and Bazel run. So we're going to start off with the Bazel run statement, which is going to run the target of Gazelle. Within Bazel, the syntax forward slash forward slash means in the root project colon and name is defined. So if you go back to the, the, the build file, you can see we have a build file. We have this name is defined within the root of the project. So we're just simply going to run that. All right. And that's going to da actually download now all the go, go rules for me. And it's, it's going out to the internet, it's going to download a specific version of Go, it's going to download a specific version of the Bazel build rules, and it's going to download all the different dependencies that I have. So a developer doesn't even need to have, once we have the project spiked with the mod file, developer doesn't even need to necessarily have Go. Uh, or say you've got um, Go 13 is installed in the developer's box, they'll still be able to manage the mod files, but we're now building the project with Go 14. So it takes a lot of the dependency management out of your hands. For example, we're gonna be running the Kubernetes build. And with the Kubernetes build, it can actually pull down a specific version of kube control. And if you ever had different versions of kube control within an, uh, within an environment, you know that's just one of the things you wanna stick with is you wanna have one version of kube control that you're deploying. But... All right, so you'll notice it created a bunch of folders for us. Now let's go back into that uh, workspace file. Within the workspace file, you notice we, we only copy and pasted uh, 
you know, we copy and paste it down here. Okay, didn't make any modifications here yet. But if we go into the build file, it's now defining a Go library for us. And it's also defining the dependencies that this Go library is using. So we've got a main.go file is uh, the library it's gonna build. And as well as it's gonna build the binary, which is Bazel Live Demo, that's based on that Go, Go library. Great, okay. Now we're gonna run one other Bazel command and that's gonna, or I'm sorry, one other Gazelle command. And that's actually gonna define the, the versions that Bazel is gonna pull down when it does the build. So let's write in that. And we're pulling down the versions of the dependencies out of the go.mod file. Great. So now if we look in the workspace file, we now have all the Go dependencies set up. And this is really the nice thing about Gazelle is, is look at, think about a little bit bigger project. You now microservice may have 30 different Go files. You've got to manage the dependencies on each of those Go files so, so Bazel understands how to build your, your, your software. With Gazelle, it automatically manages the build.bazel files as well as your workspace file. So now if we do a Bazel build, if everything is good and pure, we should be able to do this. So with, as I mentioned, Bazel build, the syntax is forward slash forward slash and three dots mean that it's running in the current directory that we're in. All right, so that's gonna actually go and fetch all of the component, all of the dependencies for us, as I mentioned. Now I've got the dependencies already cached some, so it actually ran a bit faster for me. So now if you look, we now have a new folder. That's, and we have a binary folder. So if we go into the binary folder, we now have a Darwin folder since I'm building on, on Bazel. And there's the Bazel Live demo file, which is what I call my project. You can actually define the name of this, of course, through the Go rules. And it built it for me. Yay, part of the demo worked. That's a great thing. All right, so now we have a file. We can also run that microservice or you know, run that REST service locally. And we can do that simply by calling the target again and running a Bazel run command. So again, we've got the name here, which is a target. We do Bazel run on that on there. And of course, I messed up the name. So let's go back into our build file and actually get the correct name. So, so Bazel live demo. So this now is actually running the binary. So the binary is up and running. So if we go, and I'm gonna make that screen bigger for me. I should open like three or four screens. Size that for everybody. Let's see, workspace source. Um, Chris loves CNN. Which I didn't even need to go all that way, but that's all right. Now we're going to call a curl command on the directory that, or on the REST service that's currently running in our box. So we've got a couple spiked cars in the code, and it's returning a JSON message, which is the list of all the cars that we have. And that's actually talking. So we built a binary on, on my Mac. I launched the binary with Bazel and now I can do testing or what have you within development mode where I'm actually locally able to call that binary. Great. Okay. So that's wonderful. That's basic Go and Bazel 101, but now we need to build a container. So again, and I mentioned all this stuff is different rules. So if I go to Bazel Docker rules, We're gonna pull it up. And this is, these are the Docker rules that have been built to allow building with Bazel or containers locally. Doesn't use Docker, by the way. You can build a container locally or on a build system without installing Docker, which is really nice. So if you've ever run Docker and Docker, that's kind of not fun. So we're gonna grab again the load, the archive statement, and actually this one is all only down to here. So if we go back to command line, there's a bunch of optional rules or definitions that they put in there that you don't need. 
So again, we go into our workspace file and we're gonna add in the container rules. So we're pulling down the Docker rules, version 0 0.10. And we're also going to find um, a, the image rules for the Go. So they maintain various image types within the Docker Basil rules, which actually are base stock containers that are very thin and allow you to not have a, uh, a very large container. If you understand... With containers, of course, we want to have as small a footprint as possible to make it download quick, et cetera, et cetera. But also, we don't have to maintain a lot of security stuff then if, if our rule, if, if our containers are smaller. For instance, if you're running a Debian image, you, as a base image in containers, you have to update, do all the security updates for Debian. Well, with these images, they're very small. They're based on the Go, um, the base images that, that Google produces. And we have the Go image here. Click on that. We're going to load the repository, and this defines actually the correct target for the the basil, or I'm sorry, for the container for Go. So we've loaded the Docker rules. We're now loading the container rules. All right. So now we use those rules. So if we go over to Build by Basil, we're going to go down. And we're going to define a go.image. So we're going to do another load statement, which of course defines the rule that we're going to run. And we're going to call it uh, go.image. Now they, they define a source here. And I'm going to change this around to actually using the binary. Basil live demo. Add a colon here so they know that's a name. And I could actually do this, right? But if you're in the same directory, all you have to do, so let me show that. So with this, of course, the three slashes mean the root directory, or you can hard code the path, but it's in the same directory, so we don't need to. So I'm going to use the colon, base, basal live demo, which refers to the Go binary that's just on top of this. And this will now build the Go image. So we now have a uh, go underscore image target in here. So let's run basil build again. And as I mentioned, it's now pulling down the rules for that. It's also pulling down the capability to do a local container build locally on my Mac box or in as well as it runs on Linux or it runs on Windows. And I'm getting the built container here locally. If you notice, it's, it flew through it and it gave us a bunch of tarballs, which of course is what the basis of container is. Great, now we've got a container build. Okay, now let's look at deploying it on top of Kubernetes, which is a few more steps. So if we go over to Kubernetes, basil build, it's rules underscore K8s. Same pattern, we go in the workspace, we add the we add all the files. So this is the basal build with the Docker rules, which we already have. So I need to start here. Nope, not container repositories. All I need is rules K8. So go back to our command line, workspace. So there's our container rules. Now after the container rules, we're adding the Kubernetes rules right here. While we're here, we're gonna set up some defaults for the Kubernetes server, or for the cluster rather. So here's the defaults. So this is, so inside your workspace file, and you can also do this outside of the workspace file in terms of, of variables and such, but I'm actually gonna hard code which Kubernetes cluster, this container is going to, or this deployment is going to be deployed to. So we've got a case deploy. And if you run this command uh, with kube control, if your context is set up correctly, which mine should be currently, 
it's going to give you the cluster name that we need here. I'm running a GKE cluster. And this is actually the context inside of my local authenticated kube control context that Bazel's going to use. It's going to be able to authenticate against that. And as well, it's also going to push up the container into my registry in the GKE project that I have. It, it works with AWS, it works with Azure, it works with a local registry in terms of a Docker login. So let me, let me break that up a bit. We've got authentication, right? So we're going to have to push a container to a registry and we're going to have to talk to a Kubernetes API server in order to deploy Kubernetes. So deploy container and deploy Kubernetes. Bazel's able to manage that authentication and use local, locally authenticated uh, uh, context within Kubernetes and a Docker lo login that's also set up within Docker. All right, so we've got the rules defined, we've got the default setup of which cluster this is gonna go into. Now, if I go into my build.bazel file, I'm going to define a, actually, let me copy over, I'm just gonna quickly copy over a deployment file that I have in another directory. So pretty standard stock Kubernetes deployment. We got a go deployment, we got three replicas. Now the interesting about this, or the interesting thing about this is we've got go deployment, colon, do not delete. So that is about the most bizarre image string that you've ever seen on, an, on, a, on a definition within a deployment. The nice thing about Bazel KH rules is it will modify the image tag for you or numerous other components within your deployment YAML to set up, um, to maintain the correct versioning. For instance, uh, in more complex use cases, you can actually build your deployment.yaml by say running Python or Go. So you'd actually have a program that Bazel runs to generate your YAML files or modify your YAML files. But in terms of base uh, out of the box uh, uh, support, it automatically modifies this image uh, tag form or this image definition within the YAML before it deploys it out to Kubernetes which is you know, one of the real challenges that we have in CI CD with Kubernetes is maintaining the correct image tags. So we've got the deployment.yaml set up. Now let's go back into our build.bazel. And I'm gonna look for a deploy. So I'm gonna pull in the load statement again. Now we have the name here, and I'm gonna cheat a bit because this is one of the more complex things with Kubernetes and Bazel. So I'm gonna go over to the build file that I did previously and get the correct syntax so we're not debugging this forever. So specifically, we have go deployment. It's using a template, which is the deployment.yaml, which we just downloaded. It's gonna be called go deployment, do not delete, and it, but it's using the go container. So that was what I had here before. So I'm gonna fix the name here because we've got the go image above here is now called go image, right? And now we've got the go deployment, do not delete, so let me go over to my deployment file. So I'm in the deployment YAML file. Now you notice we have go underscore deployment, do not delete. So that's actually the name of the container that's gonna be deployed out to my server. Now what's gonna happen is actually the MD5 hash is gonna be substituted in here. So if you understand tagging is typically what we use within maintaining containers. Tagging actually isn't, um, so if you have a V2 or a V1 within your container name, right? So we would have go underscore deployment V1.0. You know, that actually is not uh, deterministic. 
The only thing that's deterministic with containers is when you actually use the hash of the container, which uh, Docker registries support, but it's really long and most people don't use that. But now we have an automated system that allows you to use that. So we've got the container set up. We've got the deployment set up. So we started, or let's, let's back up to the beginning. We've got the Go build rules are defined, so we're now building our binary locally. We've got the container rules are now, or the container rules, Docker rules are now set up. So we're building our container locally. Now we have the de Kubernetes deployment rules. So now we're able to deploy that container out to Kubernetes. Now we're gonna walk through a little bit of debugging here. I know that this is gonna break, or it, it really should, because it did on Saturday. So if we do a Bazel build, I don't believe it's gonna break, it may. Again, it's going through, it's seeing that everything's been built properly, et cetera, et cetera. Now it's, def it, oh, yes, it broke. So one of the things that, so the Bazel version always goes ahead, typically, of the rules. Nice thing about Bazel is the debug, the debugging is really well laid out. They've la laid out the debug error messages really well. So if you read this message, it tells me on line 33 of the build, uh, Bazel.build, I've got a problem. It tells me I've got a def definition that isn't supported anymore, right? It says type depth set is not iterable. Use two less than the method to get a list. So what that's telling me is that the Bazel has updated the way that Skylark is used, which is in definition, but it also gives us incompatible depth set is not iterable equals false. Incredibly long statement. But the nice thing is what it's saying is that I can override the feature functionality in the Bazel binary that I'm running to allow the older rule to function with this. And they've got a whole, you know, they allow for two versions and they've got a whole versioning scheme within Bazel where they'll allow the incompatible flags to be used. And at that point, all the rules are updating uh, their, their source code so that they can now run with the latest Bazel version. So what we do is we use a file called uh, Bazel RC. So we're gonna go into a dot file called Bazel RC and I'm gonna pull the Bazel RC component tree that it, it's asking for, or the flags. Now there's a couple other flags as well that are gonna blow up on deploying. Um, it's the container rules currently uh, need host force underscore Python uh, two. If you actually read through the full readme, which I didn't do, which I often don't do, it'll tell you that in the readme on the rules page in, in GitHub. And then you notice we have build, run, and test. I mentioned we have three different base targets. They're saying, so with the, when, whenever you do a basal build, a basal run, or a basal test, you're gonna need incompatible blah, 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 blah set, right? Right. So we go back and now we can do a basal build. So you'll notice that the host force Python options change. So it's gonna go back through and do a full rebuild again. We've got the container built. Now it's building Kubernetes. Excellent. So now we've got the container built. Typically if we had unit tests, we now run the unit tests, but we're gonna jump ahead and we're gonna actually run the basal run statement. And we're gonna run, where is my run statement? So within, again, we're calling another target name. We're running the Go deployment, which is already set up in our build.bazel, but we're running a dot apply, which is new. So within the Kubernetes rules, we have apply, delete, as well as other CRUD targets. So basically we have create, read, update, and deploy, and delete, all built into the Kubernetes build rules which gives us the capability of deploying a new deployment up, uh, updating it, as well as creating it, or I'm sorry, as well as deleting it. Nice thing is to say you have multiple deployments within your repository. Say you have one microservice, which, can, which has two different containers, or a microservice which has a you know, couple different deployments within it, which is an unheard of. Bazel will only deploy what's changed again. It is dry. So you change one container, only that container, not all three containers are gonna be deployed out for you, which is really nice. 
So let's hit the button here. You can see that it's now running a crew control command and I'm getting an error, which is awesome. Hey Chris, I'm just gonna do a little time check here. So yeah. we're at 42 minutes. <laughs> I know um, a handful of people have dropped off. So I was just curious for those of you who are here, thanks for listening and is there any point where, um, are there any questions or any point maybe yep. people felt like a little lost with the bigger concepts? Um, thanks for your question. It looks like you're both building and deploying using Bazel. How would this fit into the larger CICD ecosystem such as Spinnaker, Flux, Argo CD, et cetera? And how would you accomplish more advanced deployment strategies like canary deployments, blue green, et cetera? So that's a, <laughs> thank you. Thank you for your hefty question, but yeah, maybe it's it good, it'd be good to kind of help see how this fits into the bigger picture. The yeah. mind picture. And I can talk through it and let me stop my video here. So it goes back to, nope, not that one. Let me stop sharing. It's a good point. Um, let me just wrap up here. If everything was good and pure in the, in the demo world, it would have actually deployed out of deployment onto Kubernetes, but I'm hitting 401, which most likely I've got to uh, reinitialize my context and or I didn't set up my context correctly. So let me stop sharing. So Spinnaker. Um, Spinnaker is a huge, it's, it's everything, right? You can do your full build. You can do pretty much everything out of the box with Spinnaker. One of the things you are able to do is create uh, containers with Spinnaker in a registry and you could push your uh, containers up to the registry using Bazel and just do the container rules and then you allow Spinnaker to run your deployments. Not too familiar with Flux. I know I've had some conversations and I believe that you can integrate a build tool into Flux, but I'll, I'll let the folks over at Weave answer that properly. Let's take a, a pretty typical use case of Jenkins with uh, enterprises. You know, they should be using Flex or they should be using some other, you know, more modern build tool, but you go into a lot of enterprises and they're still using Jenkins. With Jenkins, you'd actually run the Bazel command in your, in your repository on a, on a Jenkins trigger. And you would have a container within Jenkins that has Bazel installed. It would go through the same process. You'd authenticate with Docker, you'd authenticate with, with Kubernetes, then you'd run the Bazel build and it'd pull everything in. Nice thing with, uh, with Bazel though, with the build tools is you're able to do again, as what I mentioned, remote builds and caching as well. So you can integrate all that in into as well. So in terms of bigger scheme, you're able to run your CI CD off of in the exact same way that developers are doing it locally. And that's, that's really powerful in my mind. You're using the exact same tooling that a developer is running locally. You're, you have hermetic and deterministic builds. So you're able to do that locally. Um, whether you're running on Linux, or you're running a Mac, shouldn't make much of a difference. That's helpful. Thanks for the question. Um, did we answer your question fully, or do you have any additional comments for that? I do appreciate that. Anybody else? Um, can you guys see my slide? It's always hard to tell on Zoom. Chris, can you see my slide? I can. We've online okay. users. So, um, okay, so we got a yes for somebody to, to us saying that that helps answer that. Um, if you have any others while we're waiting, um, I will just share here. So if you're new to our Weave online user group, welcome. And we've got a couple more dates here in September with other speakers. Um, if you are interested, like I said, we usually meet on Tuesdays at 10 a.m. Pacific time. We'll be covering uh, other related topics, such as running Kubernetes on bare metal um, and Istio and service meshes. Um, I think that one's actually useful for some people because sometimes um, Istio can bring complexity that might not be necessary for your particular use case. So this covers, um, that'll be with, um, I don't want to get it wrong. Is it Rob uh, Richardson? I think that's what it is. And um, so, yeah, we're really lucky to have him cover that topic. And we've got more coming up in October, but these are our September dates. 
Um, if you are interested in future events, uh, our single source of truth calendar is probably the best place is our meetup page is a weave user group. Uh, and if you have any questions uh, regarding this, uh, we, you can meet us on our Slack page or you can email me. Um, you'll get an email after this with some of these links, um, including our GitOps ebook uh, in case you're interested in additional information around our GitOps con concept. So with that, let me just double check to see if there are any other chats. If not, um, Chris, thanks for, so much for joining and just letting people know, we were chatting about this and if this went too deep or if you have any feedback, let us know because we will actually be um, doing more uh, talks on Basil because we do think there are other topics that would be interesting and so maybe we'll modify if it goes a little too deep. Um, but we have a follow-up as well, so let's cover this. Um, so a little bit more on the previous question. Um, I'd be curious to hear why you would want to deploy using Bazel, um, I guess compared to these, some of these other examples. For deterministic builds or incremental builds, Bazel is amazing and makes sense. For actual deployments, what are the benefits that you would get for using Bazel? And the use case seems, <laughs> so a little feedback, the use case seems weaker than the alternatives um, is I guess what this person wants to know. So Chris, since you are a, an advocate and you're very excited about Bazel, this will be a great opportunity here. Like, what are the good use cases for Bazel? So the interesting thing about Bazel, and let's go to a mono repository, and it doesn't necessarily need to be with a mono repository. You would have, say, 15 different microservices within your mono repository. You're able to only deploy the microservices that have changed. No, I don't know of any other build system that does that. When you're running a build, you have to either create a Jenkins target that you know, go through and specifies, you know, each one of those builds, et cetera, et cetera. So again, you're creating deterministic and heretic and, and her, hermetic builds and dry builds within the deployment of Kubernetes system. So say you have three different components within Bazel, you're able to only deploy out exactly what's changed. And that, that, from my standpoint, that's pretty big. You're only building the container that's changed. You're only running the tests on that container that's changed you're only doing the deployment that's changed. As well as it gives you capability to generate, say, your YAML files uh, by, by using code. There's different technologies out there. Um, and even with the new kube control command, you have capability of doing environment replacement or doing patching uh, with, um, I, I forget the, the kube control command now that allows you to do patching within your YAML files. We're able to program, programmatically do that. I have clients that use, for instance, Python to completely build their YAML files. They, they don't have actual YAML files in their directories. They run Python with Bazel, create the YAML files, then deploy that out. So it, yes, it's a little bit complex. Uh, it's not Spinnaker, which is you know, the, the system that, you know, it, it's a whole other system. And I'm not gonna talk about competition between the two. They're both great systems. What I'm talking about is, is the capability of building a local build that runs exactly the same way on a developer's machine as it does on the, on the CICD. And that's, that's, you know, with running uh, CICD, that's typically the challenge is getting the builds right. Uh, and that's what Blaze, you know, does. And that's what Bazel strives to do as well. So I hope I answer a little bit of that in terms of use cases. Yeah. Maybe in the future we could bring some people who do use it to cover some of those additional use cases. Yep. Cool. Well, thank you again for your questions. And thank you so much, Chris. It's really good seeing you. It's been a long time. I don't know if people know Chris, but now he has this distinguished beard. <laughs> So uh, thanks again, and um, like I said, I'll follow up. If you have any questions, you'd like to chat with us, um, you can join our Slack, or Chris, you're on Kubernetes Slack, I assume, if you have questions specifically for him. So thanks again for joining, and we will see you next week. Thanks, Chris. Thank you for spending time with us this afternoon. Yes. Bye-bye.